Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking in an in-person event again. This is my second in-person event this year. So um, yeah, hopefully it will be fun. Uh, and um, my work, my research that I do at Trend Micro, I'm presenting to you today. But you know, general disclaimer, I'm speaking by myself, not my employer. So let's get started. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I've I practice martial arts for almost 20 years now, on and off. Going to back to Japan this year to uh, continue training, practice a martial art called ninjutsu. Don't know if you know if you heard about it. Uh, as my friend mentioned, I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been in Canada for almost five years now, living there. So it was nice change of weather there, coming from the cold and snow. And okay, yeah, it's it's cloudy, but it's not that cold, so it's good. Um, I've been involved with OWASP for 12 years, so I led one of the longest running chapters in Brazil. Uh, for five years, we, we were the, one of the most active ones. I organized the OWASP Paraíba Day in 2012 and also created the JumpaSec Security Conference in 2015 in Brazil. Um, I have a, a blog and kind of my my personal brand there with uh, Katana Security. The blog is, is shut down right now. I'm, I'm moving to another place server, but uh, yeah, it's katanasec.com and you can see all my kind of blogs and presentations and previous talks. There are slides or videos. It's all gonna be there very soon, including these slides. I'm gonna share there as well. But if you wanna follow me, if you wanna find out more about me, just look at Magno Logan on Twitter, uh, Mastodon and LinkedIn, that's kind of where I am. Um, I'm also part of the Nebula team inside Trend Micro. So I'm part of Trend Micro Canada and a security researcher. And so inside Trend Micro, we have different researcher teams. And our team, the Nebula team, that's how we call ourselves, kind of an internal team name. Um, basically, we focus on cloud and container security research. So we've done we've done research around uh, DevOps and Jenkins, for example. In the past, um, we've we've published some CVs, some zero days. Um, we've done research on Docker and Redshift, and also you know the major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, GCP. We have a great research uh, being published very soon about Azure machine learning. So you you want to find out about that, uh, a friend of mine that has done it, it's incredible, but we're still waiting for Microsoft to fix some of the bugs. So yeah, stay tuned. Uh, and also a part of Go Hacking. Uh, Go Hacking is a company back in Brazil. We provide technical training in uh, cybersecurity, hacking, pen testing, uh, DevSecOps, secure coding, and uh, malware analysis, all kinds of things, very technical. Uh, most of the courses are online and uh, they are in Portuguese, but I know there are a lot of Brazilians here. I, I only listen to Portuguese when I arrive. said, okay, maybe I'm back in Brazil, I don't know. Uh, but we're launching some of the courses in English this year and, and a few of them next year soon. So uh, yeah, just stay tuned for that. Um, so before we start, I just wanna do a quick game with everyone here. Um, simple game. Ireland or Brazil? You tell me. Ireland or Brazil? Ireland, right? Okay, good, good. Yeah, let's, let's, come on. You got, you had your coffee already, right? You guys awake? Simple one, Brazil, good, good. What about this one? Maybe both. If you add whiskey, right? I just got the, the whiskey there, uh, Irish coffee. Hmm? Brazil? Ireland, okay, maybe both as well. That can be debatable. If it's black, if it's Guinness, then yeah. Right. What? Cold, yeah. <laughs> okay. Loud, people are loud, people are talking. Brazil, okay, good. And traffic? Both, I saw both. At least that's my impression from here. I don't know, from, you know, I'm around the downtown, so it's fine. But yeah, uh, just one more thing, fun fact, and I did double check that this morning. The population of 
the whole country of Ireland is less than the city of Rio de Janeiro. So just that red part over there has more people than the whole country of Ireland. Okay, okay so let's start. Uh, this is my training, the secure coding and, and DevSecOps training. I'm not going to talk about that much, but if you want to scan the QR code or get the link, you can find, uh, read the description, see uh, what I teach, and, and kind of find out more. We're probably launching a new uh, cohort, a new session, the second half of this year. I'm currently, currently working on a new course that's uh, about Docker and Kubernetes security. So that should come on the first semester of uh, this year. Okay, there has been a lot of layoffs lately. You're probably aware of that, and hopefully you're not one, one of the affected ones. But I, as, as I'm involved with OWASP since the beginning, I've been, uh, the community has given so much to me, and I learned so much with OWASP that I always like to give back. And, and one of the ways that I do it is presenting and giving talks, sharing knowledge. And the other way is, uh, helping people and, and helping in a way that what can I do? Like, okay, there is a lot of layoffs. People are looking for jobs and stuff. So what I do is for uh, any IT person, um, any background, doesn't need to be security. If you want, if you're interested, if you're looking for a job, if you're affected by the layoffs, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and I can do uh, free things for you. Uh, I can review your resume and provide my feedback for free. I can review your LinkedIn page and provide some feedback there as well. See, maybe, maybe you're not finding the right jobs. And I can also do a mock interview. So I'm the one kind of hiring you and I interview like a technical interview. And of course in English uh, and, and then we practice, right? Of course, everything here is for free. Uh, it just needs to adjust to my schedule. And sometimes it can take a couple weeks for me to be able to, to have uh, a spot for you. But if you want to learn more, if you want to find out, yeah, this is for free. Okay. Uh, we just published our blog on GitHub code spaces. This talk is not about code spaces, about GitHub actions, but uh, we just published the research that I did with uh, a colleague of mine, Nitesh, from our team, the Nebula team, and it's interesting as well. And we're presenting this research together with the GitHub actions one in May at NDC Oslo. So Oslo, Norway, we're gonna be there. Okay, this is the agenda, finally. Yeah, I know you guys are waiting for that. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. And we have a, a quick overview about GitHub Actions. Um, who here has used GitHub Actions before? Raise your hand. Okay, good, awesome, that's nice. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do a quick overview, uh, at least just to uh, kind of lay, lay off the land so that we can go to the, the security part. I'm gonna talk about abusing runners and uh, understanding what runners are and how attackers are, are abusing that to mostly mine cryptocurrencies. That's gonna be fun. Uh, I'm gonna talk about malicious actions, which was kind of the main part of my research. Uh, we have like the marketplace and what happens if someone publishes a malicious actions and another person uses, right? Unintentionally or intentionally. Um, then I'm gonna talk about a few attacks, uh, some other things that are happening there uh, around GitHub Actions that you need to be aware of. And of course, some countermeasures. Sounds good? Uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. Uh, we're, we're gonna have time at the end but if you need to interrupt, if it's something quick, I can, I can do it, no problem. Uh, okay, here yeah, you're ready, you're raising your hand? No problem. It's similar. It's, it's very similar. Yeah, uh, this testing has been only on GitHub Actions, but it, it might apply to GitLab. So GitLab deploys on GCP, and it's also a YAML file. You can have your own runners. You have self-hosted runners. So it's very similar, right? Same, same, but different, right? So that's what they say. Uh, and yeah, some countermeasures there. These are the two articles that I publish around this research. So if there is something that I don't speak here, if I, there is no time, uh, you can find all the information there on those two articles. The first one, uh, yeah, from last year, yeah, beginning of last year, and the other one mid last year. So, okay. 
Oh, yeah. And special thanks to Alfredo from my team and uh, Felipe, uh, also uh, a security researcher from Brazil, for helping me with this work. Okay. So, overview of actions. What is GitHub Actions? Who can tell me a simple, quick answer of what is GitHub Actions? Anyone? Runtime for CI, CI CD pipeline. It's a uh, better Jenkins, Jenkins 2.0. I don't know, maybe. Uh, debatable there. But yeah, it's the kind of the service provided by GitHub for you to run automations, right? For you to create your own pipelines and you can do you can build your applications, you can run testing, you can uh, uh, you know, scan your binaries, scan your code, for example. There's a lot of things that you can do there. And you can do it in two ways. You can leverage the servers provided by GitHub themselves, which are actually in Azure, right? GitHub is owned by Microsoft now. So you can run their own servers, their own servers. you can run your automation there and you don't pay for anything. Of course, there are limits, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Or you can have your self-hosted runners where you have your servers on any place, any cloud provider, anywhere, and you run your automation there, right? And it's very simple. It's just YAML files, and lately, who hasn't, using, who hasn't been using YAML files, right? So if, you, if you played with Kubernetes, if you played with, ah, uh, infrastructure as code, you probably play, played with some YAML files, and GitHub Actions is the same. So it's very simple to read the files, and you can configure them uh, you know, in a way that you can run your automations very easily. The files have to stay inside a folder inside your repository on GitHub. The repository is called .github slash workflows. Remember that. It's not workflow, it's workflows, even if you have just one. Uh, I made that mistake myself and I spent like at least two hours figuring out why it wasn't running. So that's why I wanna point that out. When you have those files inside your repository, like something needs to happen for them to start your automation. And this something is called <clears throat> an event. An event, it's something that happens to your repo. It can be uh, a pull request, a push, any changes to your repository, or you can also run that manually. Like you can start that manually on demand. So there's different events. You can check out the, the GitHub documentation there, the GitHub Actions documentation. There are many different events. We're gonna see a few of them today here, but I'm not gonna be able to cover every single one. And uh, the runners provided by GitHub for free are free, the free major operating systems. So you have Linux, which is the Ubuntu one, uh, you have Windows, and you even have a Mac OS. So for people uh, uh, who struggle sometimes testing on Mac OS, now you have that for free. It's more expensive in kind of the limits uh, uh, sense, but you can have it. And any GitHub account can use it today. So even if you have a free account, you don't wanna pay, you can start using GitHub Actions today. Uh, as I said, there are some limits, but you can do it, right? Just don't run crypto mining, please. So let's see if I can get this. Okay, yeah. Uh, so you have an event, something happens, right? Let's say a pull request. Someone submits a pull request or someone makes a changes to your repository. That event triggers the workflow, triggers an action, right? And the action is going to deploy, in this case here, two runners, runner one and runner two. And when I say runner, think of VMs, servers, right? Uh, it's a machine that's deployed on Azure or on your own environment that's going to do some automation for you. Runner one, runner two. Okay, runner one is going to run job one. And job one is a city of a series of actions. It can be, uh, when I say actions, it can be not, not GitHub actions, but a series of commands or other actions. So for example, I can run a script, like a shell script or a PowerShell script if it's Windows, 
or I can run other actions. So inside my action, I can call a third party action from someone else and run that inside mine. Do you see a problem here already? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, and then, for example, here in a way, I have another VM, runner two, which is running job two, and it has actions and scripts and everything. Uh, the way that they are connected here, it it means something, and we're gonna, we're gonna see that later. Like, okay, runner one, uh, actually, runner two needs runner one to finish before it can start running. So there is some dependency here between those jobs, right? Or actions. Okay. You probably, if you use Jenkins before, you use Jenkins plugins, right? And you remember how hard it is to deal with plugins. Not just Jenkins, but WordPress, anything. You have to keep them updated. They have a lot of vulnerabilities. They are created by third party. You, there is no kind of um, checking for security for if the code is well developed, right? If there is no kind of uh, vetting process for that. Marketplace is the same thing. So you have a marketplace, a GitHub Actions marketplace where anyone anyone here today you can go to github and you can publish a github action to the marketplace for free and depending on what you do with your action if someone oh finds that out okay that action is interesting and they start calling in their own actions right there is a dependency there if your action is doing something legitimate that's great but what happens if your action is not right you can do different things with your actions, as I said, uh, the, uh, testing, right? So for security purposes, we're in security event, we're talking about OWASP, you can run DAST, you can run SAS, you can run SCA, anything that you can automate there that you used to run on your Jenkins, forget Jenkins, maybe go to GitHub Actions, and, and I'm gonna talk about that later, but like there are some problems, but it's, it's much better and much easier than Jenkins. Uh, container security as well, so you can scan your images before, like once you build the binary, the container image, before you upload to a registry, you can scan it, right? There are all free and open source tools that you can do that. Um, and you have integrations with APIs as well, so there's many other things. So if you wanna check out the marketplace, there are 17,000 third-party actions already available, so 17,000 plugins. Right, and this uh, increased 2,000 from last month. So last month was 15,000. When I presented at uh, NDC Security in Oslo last month, it was 15,000. So it's growing really fast. Yeah, actions. So if you go to the marketplace and you select there the filter, there is apps and actions. If you select actions, you're going to see that number probably has increased already. I got this number today, this morning, because I have to keep updating this slide every time I present because it's changing a lot. Okay, <clears throat> so before we move on to the fun part, let's take a look at one action here. I bring one as just an example and I brought the Nuclei or Nuclei scan. Who has used Nuclei before? Okay, good, it's a DAS scan, really nice. I know people in the back may not be able to see it, but I'll try to read it for you. So here, name, pretty simple. Name of the action that you have. You can put any name there. Uh, not any name, but almost everything. And then there is this directive here, this kind of on. What does that mean? That means the events that will trigger your action, right? So when are your events are going to run on? Here we have two type of events that will trigger this action, the nuclei scan. You have the schedule one, so you can even have your action running periodically, right? You can use the same approach that you do for a cron tab, you can use it here, same thing. And if you, if you struggle with cron tab like me, there are websites that can generate that for you. So that's fine. Uh, and you also have workflow dispatch. Workflow dispatch, just means run on demand. 
I can trigger this job. I can click on a button. The developer can go into the repo and run that on demand. That's it. Jobs. And you can see here that the word is plural, but if you look at the YAML file, I only have one job, which is the nuclear scan. So technically, I'm going to only have one VM, one runner for this whole action. But there are many steps, right? There are different steps here. And uh, before I go into the steps, you see runs on Ubuntu latest. What does that mean? It means that it's using the latest version of Ubuntu provided by GitHub on Azure. So I think the latest one, it might be 20.04, 20 20 yeah, or, or something, yeah. But you can check, there is the documentation available for you. You can see what's installed inside those VMs as well, like what comes with that, and, and what are the risks for using those VMs. You're trusting all that code that's inside those VMs for running your actions as well. So just be aware of that. Yeah, there is Ubuntu latest, Windows latest, and Mac OS latest. That's kind of the, yeah, the latest version. Just like what you do for your containers, which you shouldn't do using the latest tag. But here, I guess it's recommended. Um, and the first step here, actions, uses actions slash checkout at V2. What does that mean? Anyone? Let's see if you really know actions. Yeah, so there is a, a repo called inside github.com slash action, oops, sorry, press the wrong button, slash actions slash checkout. So if you go to this URL, github.com slash actions slash checkout, you're going to see the code of this third-party action. This one is provided by GitHub, which technically is safe, but yeah, I'm using the version two of this action. And we're gonna talk about this versioning uh, uh, later as well. So uh, the first step in my action, I'm already calling a third-party action. And there is a dependency here, right? So I'm calling v2. What happens if they update the version? What happens if there is a problem or a vulnerability or something and they update it? You see a pattern here. The same thing that happens to your libraries right, your dependencies, everything is going to happen here for your actions. You're going to have, keep monitoring those third-party actions that you're using and keep updating those if you, if you have to, if there are some issues with them. And uh, the second step, so in any kind of these blocks here, each one of these one step. The second step is calling another third-party action where you have the nuclei desk and I can give it a name and it's a using another one. Now, from project discovery slash nuclei dash action at main. So if you go to github.com slash project discovery slash nuclei dot action, you're going to see the code that's being downloaded inside your runner and being run there, right? And the main one is the kind of the main branch, right? That's it. And there is some parameter here with, so I have, I'm, I'm specifying a parameter example.com, right? Example.com, this is my target, right? This is the website that I want Nuclei to scan, right? Probably is going to be my developer or my uh, QA environment, right? Or production if you're brave enough. Um, and then there is some other actions, similar approach, always using third-party actions here um, with workflow artifacts and uh, the serif results. What, what, what does, does that mean? The problem is, and, and I didn't say that earlier, when my action finishes, when my workflow completes, the VM gets destroyed. I don't have access to that VM anymore, right? So if I want anything that was generated during my pipeline, during the, the workflow there, I need to upload somewhere. And the, the way that I do it is I upload back to my repo using either one of these actions or something else, right? The first, the, the kind of the first one uh, here, the workflow artifact uploads the logs. So if something happened with Nuclei, it wasn't able to reach the 
uh, the target or something happened, I need to debug. I'm not going to be able to access the logs if I don't upload it, right? And the second one is the output the ge that was generated from uh, Nuclei as well and uh, the, the results, what we found on the dot .serif uh, extension, which is a common extension created by Microsoft. And now, since GitHub is owned by Microsoft, they're using it as well. Same thing. Yeah, basically. Okay? Is, are we all on the same page here on how actions work, a few steps, and... Okay, awesome. And you can check out the, the action there on the GitHub Marketplace as well. So feel free. So yeah, this is just a description of what I just said. Uh, I'll share those slides later, so I don't need to spend much time there. Okay, let's start with the fun part. Vulnerabilities. When I started doing this research back in October 2021, actually, um, there were some blogs, a few blogs already, most of them from the GitHub Security Lab on some of the issues and vulnerabilities around uh, around actions, around this topic, right? One of them are called pull requests from forked repos and something that we're going to see that was happening in, right in the beginning. Action is, is something that's fairly new service. It was, uh, uh, it started in 2019, so just a couple of years now. And we're also, there is an also uh, a topic on command injection. Some of the fields, and, and this is basic for, for everyone here, right? AppSec, you should validate all your inputs, right? Some of the fields on your actions, it can be untrusted, right? You can specify, you can manipulate, you can do injection and command injection, for example. For whatever it's running inside that runner, if I specify a command in, in one of the fields there and it reads from there, it's going to run it, right? It's going to execute that command. So yeah, always validate your inputs. Uh, and of course, malicious GitHub actions from the marketplace. Since we're on the topic of supply chain attacks, it seems everybody's talking about it. Uh, when I started doing this research, I thought to myself, okay, what happens if someone uploads a malicious action to the marketplace and another someone, another developer starts using it? Oh, this is nice, right? I'll start using this, this interesting action that does uh, nothing. Uh, uh, Apparently, I don't know. Of course, I didn't do that. I didn't publish to the marketplace for ethical reasons, but I, I did some testing and I validated that uh, and as we're going to see. So this was kind of the main part of the research. Pull requests from forked repos. And uh, there is a, a, the blog there from, from the GitHub security lab team. Uh, what was happening here, and this is kind of solved by now, hopefully, uh, what happens is if you have your repo and you have actions running on your repo, you're already using GitHub actions. When I forked your repo and uh, I made some changes, right? I want to make some changes. I forked there and then I send it back, send the pull request back to the original, to the source. When I sent the pull request back there, I was able to manipulate, to change your actions to my own. So because I had write permissions to your own repo, I was able to manipulate your actions. So instead of running your automation there, it was running what? What do you guys see here? Can you see the code? XM rig. Does that ring a bell? Crypto mining. So people, uh, attackers automated this. They started forking uh, hundreds of repos that we're using actions and automating the pull requests back to the source. And uh, what was happening was the legitimate user was being affected, deploying a malicious instance on Azure and mining cryptocurrencies. And when GitHub and Microsoft noticed that, they said, oh, why are you doing that? We're gonna block your user. We're gonna block your repo. And People started, what, what happened? I didn't do anything. Like I'm innocent, right? That's when they started looking and digging deeper into the problem and finding out that they weren't the culprit. The culprit was the person uh, providing and sending the, the forked 
pull request back to the source. That was interesting. So there is a countermeasure there at the end that I'm going to talk about that fixes this and it kind of it's enabled by default uh, and, and avoids that from happening. I haven't seen that uh, again in a while. So yeah. Okay, abusing Windows runners. We talked about thirty party uh, third party actions already, right? You can see here, and this is a code from a, a YAML code from an action, a malicious one. And look at line, how do you see it? Line 18? Yeah, 18. This is a malicious action, right? Just to, to be clear about that. But it's using this third party action here on line 18. Nick dash envision slash retry at v2. Is Nick here? Nick, please raise your hand. No? Okay. So I investigated this action, and it's a legitimate action. It has legitimate purposes. But the attackers are already leveraging that for their malicious gains. So they know that, they know better than us that write applications, they know how to leverage that. Why, why, why they're doing that? This retry action, it retries your action if, if it fails, right? There's some parameters there. So if something happens, they're not able to deploy their crypto miner, it's gonna try again and try again, right? So, like, it, this is interesting. This is amazing. Like, they're already using those third-party actions for their own gains, for malicious purposes. And, of course, the last command here we, we see, the node.exe, node.exe, okay, XM rig, and then if you're a crypto miner, fan, or something, you probably know what that is, right? There's the pool, and then the, the user of that pool. This is mining cryptocurrency on a Windows, deployed on Azure by GitHub Action. Oh, is there a limit? Yes, there is a limit. Each job can run only for six hours, if I'm not, no. Each, I think, yeah. Each, uh, no, each step, each step can run for six hours, up to six hours, and each job can run up to 72 hours. So the VM is going to stay on running for three days, mining cryptocurrencies for free. They're not paying anything out of it. So even if it's just three days, they're going to get some cents. I don't know if it's prof profitable today, right, with the prices going down, but, well, it's free money. So, yeah, leveraging the third-party GitHub action there. I analyzed this one and analyzed the code from Nick, the retry one, the, the one that I mentioned in line 18. And it's legitimate. It has legitimate purposes, but it's being abused already. And of course, the node.exe file, right? If you check it out on Firestoto, it's malicious. It's a crypto miner, XM rig, fine. And sometimes they don't even try to hide it, right? They, like, they're, they're not trying to uh, be stealthy about it. A few of them are. A few of them we're going to see are even limiting the CPU resources that their crypto miner is going to use to avoid detection. Some of them are, okay, yeah, only use up to 70% CPU because, you know, if you're running the crypto miner, it's going to want everything. It's probably going to go to 100%, you know, making it easier to detect from a GitHub and Microsoft. Windows Runners Part 2, this one wrote a PowerShell. Now it's using a PowerShell script to automate his mining. And uh, I didn't explain there on the previous script, but do you know what that is? Matrix. Who knows what that means? What is it doing here in the matrix? Anyone? Running multiple versions, right? You, you use Matrix. If you want to test your software on different versions, different operating systems, different platforms, you can do that. You can use Matrix. But they're doing that to scale, to run in parallel, multiple jobs, multiple runners at the same time, right? If I can run 100 or, or whatever limit there is, why not? Why am I going to run only one? If I can, I can make 100 times more money. Um, and then there is the PowerShell script. I'm not very good at PowerShell, but I know that this is kind of a curl request, downloading the 
uh, Zip Crypto Miner, XM Rig, uh, extracting. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward there. And then running, right? Running here. So yeah, I, I, I don't recall which one, uh, which example I had, but there was one that was like, okay, uh, on the command here for the XM Rig, there was the parameter to limit the CPU resources to 70%. So that's, yeah. But yeah, same thing. And interesting enough, this code, Captain Crypto, right? I found it the same code on these repos and 100 more, plus 100 more. Same things, exactly same code. Of course, sometimes maybe using, changing the username for the crypto mining wallet, and sometimes not even that. So maybe it's a group, it's a, I don't know, try actor, something that is doing that. Most of these repos we reported to GitHub. Actually, we reported all of the repos to GitHub for them to take down. They took uh, more than six months to reply back to us. Uh, we try to go through the proper, proper channels. I try to talk to them and everything. Uh, I don't know if there is anyone from GitHub here, but we, we need to chat. Um, but some of them are still up. So some of them, if you, if you just go to the repo, can still find the code there. I don't know why, but well, we reported, so. Uh, now Linux, same approach, just changes the code. Instead of Windows, Linux, oh, downloading the XM rig, extracting it, uh, running some commands, I don't know why, PWD ls, okay. And look at the name of the job there, the job, uh, the, the step, let's mine, right? They're not trying to be stealthy about it, they, they, I don't know, they, they think they're not getting caught. Um, but yeah, they're running the crypto miner and running it again. I don't know why they're doing that. So they have two processes or whatever. But yeah, it's uh, the same command. So XM rig and XM rig is Monero crypto mining uh, coin most of the time. But yeah. Now, this is new. This is the first time you're seeing this. Uh, abusing macOS runners. I, uh, I started looking at that like end of last year. I went back to my research and kind of, okay, maybe there's something else here. Let me see if there's anything new, what's happening there. Because yeah, I did that in, as I said, uh, in late 2021 and we published the article and everything. So I went digging and I found this repo here. Yeah, if you can copy, it's fine. Uh, it's still there. But it says, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, there is some stuff in, in Chinese, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, hacking Tosh, core books, something. It seemed legitimate. It really seemed legit, at least from my perspective. Um, and there, this language here, ASL, everything, okay. I, I checked, I saw there was the GitHub workflows uh, folder. Okay, let me look at the workflows. That makes it easier to read. Oh, yeah. Name, workflow CI. Okay, yeah. Continuous integration. That makes sense. On push, branch main, and branch, and on pull request, branch main. Okay, yeah. That's kind of a standard. Workflow dispatch. You can run on demand. And then there is jobs. Build. Yeah, you... you Technically, you name build when you want to build your binary, your application, right? And it runs on macOS latest. That's why I call it macOS runner, right? It's using the macOS version VM from Azure. Actions, check out. Now it's version 3, so it's using the latest version. I think it's the latest one, which is good, right? Downloading the checkout uh, action basically downloads the code from that repo inside the VM that's running your automation, right? Inside your action, your runner, right? And now, now it starts to get interesting. Okay, what is that? Just giving execute permissions to the binary, the XM rig, uh, and the XM rig no fee. It didn't download it. You see that the previous ones, they downloaded the binary. This one, it didn't. Where is it coming from? From the repo. Yeah, it's already there. It's inside the repo. And it starts running uh, multiple times. There's more there. I don't know why, but yeah, I think they're trying to scale. And yeah, basically, 
it's a crypto miner for Mac OS. And uh, when I ran that the first time, uh, see November, uh, yeah, November, 21 of November last year, it only had 23 detections. So less than half. I think now it's exactly half detections on the virus soda. It's still, still way to go. But, but yeah, it's a macho file. So you can see there is a binary from a Mac OS, which is mining cryptocurrencies on a Mac OS runner. Uh, and funny enough, when you go to the actions tab of that repo, you're going to see this kind of warning. This GitHub actions is currently disabled. I wonder what that is. Every time that GitHub flags uh, a kind of abuse or mostly crypto mining, they block your repo from running the actions, from deploying the VMs on Azure and run your automation. So every time you see that warning there, be aware of that repo, right? Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, and so block it, rekitty up actions, and um, just make sure that, yeah, if you see that, they block, probably block, but what happens is they're blocking that action from that repo, that's it. If I create another repo, I can still run actions. If I create another user and then create another repo, I can still run actions. So the attackers are not just manually doing that, right? They're automating, they're scripting, they're using APIs. So it, that's easy, like bypassable for them. Oh, sorry? Good question. I haven't tried, yeah, should work, yeah. Uh, we also publish an article there uh, about more cloud-based crypto mining, not just GitHub Actions from the other uh, threat research team from, um, from Trend Micro. Sorry, I'm running out of time, so just being conscious of the time here. Um, and, and you can see there, there are more details, not just uh, uh, GitHub Actions, but other service, free services in the cloud that attackers are abusing to mine cryptocurrencies. And that's what we're seeing most of the time. Kubernetes, Docker, we deploy Docker honeypots, we deploy Kubernetes honeypots, and most of the time when they compromise these honeypots, it's mostly like 99% mine cryptocurrencies, that's it. The command injections part, I said before, this is the list of uh, fields that are uh, untrusted and that you can do some command injection. I won't talk more up much about that because I won't have time. Um, and uh, there was before, not anymore, there was a web server enabled by default on your Ubuntu runner. There was HTTPD, Apache, there was Nginx. They were both disabled by default, but this one was enabled. Mono XSP web server. Who has, who has heard about that? Nobody, right? This is like a very, very old web server from Microsoft written in ASP, and now this is C Sharp. And you can see on Shodan that there aren't a lot of instances of that. You know what it is? Yeah. What it is? Yeah, yeah. Well, the web server, the mono one? Yeah. But why was it, was it running there, and why was it enabled by default? That's the question, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that's kind of my assumption there, and I describe in more details in my blog. Uh, I think there was something for administration purposes from Azure, from the Microsoft team to, to deal with the VM, get some heartbeats or health purposes. That's what I'm assuming. But you can see here that it was active on port 8084, uh, and that's not anymore. Like the latest versions, if you check the latest version of your Ubuntu instance provided by uh, GitHub, it's not, it's not there anymore. They removed it. Either they removed the documentation or they removed just, uh, they really removed the server. I haven't tested that yet. But that was funny. Uh, I actually downloaded the code for this repo and I said, okay, maybe there is a vulnerability in that repo, that, in that web server that I can exploit. Uh, I tried, uh, and this is just the example here, here that the repos, the, the web server is there. And um, yeah. Some errors. I tried running SEMGRAP. I know that SEMGRAP is, is here in the event today. I tried running SEMGRAP rules for, for C Sharp uh, to find some vulnerability in the code. Didn't work. Maybe, maybe uh, some of the SEMGRAP team can help me. We'll see. 
and see if. But now that's not enabled uh, anymore. Maybe maybe it's not worth it. We'll see. Uh, okay. Last part, and I'm almost done. Uh, and I will have time for questions, and we can also ask questions at the end. I'll be here at the event uh, today and tomorrow, so uh, we can do that. I talked about malicious GitHub actions. Make sure that, as I said, there is no vetting process for, uh, for the actions that are published on the marketplace. But there is only one thing. There is like the blue check mark, like Twitter has it. No, I know I shouldn't be talking about Twitter anymore, but okay. But yeah. Um, you can see that creator verified by, by GitHub. What does that mean? It means that it was verified by GitHub, but it doesn't mean that it was checked for security. It doesn't mean that it was checked by for vulnerabilities, right? It just means that technically GitHub knows this company or this person, but better than nothing. At least try to look for that. If it doesn't have it, just be more suspicious about your third party actions. And as I said, as well, you can check if you want to read the code of your third-party actions, you can take a look at the, the, the GitHub of the, the repository of, of that action, right? So if you go to github.com slash the name of the user, this is the user or organization, and the name of the repo, the action itself, and you can take a look at the code there. Might be JavaScript or something. Um, I said, like, the attack part... That's what I did during my research. I was able to run Nmap inside the, the Azure, uh, inside the VM, right? The, the machine that I had control of and uh, running, seeing if there are other targets, if I could move laterally. Um, we'll see the results. I was able to do the reverse shell on the runner from external server. So if we saw the, the way that I was showing the actions here, um, basically every time I wanted to run my automation, I would have to change the file, the YAML file, and then publish or run on demand, right? That was taking a lot of time and it can be very troublesome. So what I did was I deployed one action, uh, one uh, uh, runner, and I made it to connect back to another machine outside of Azure, uh, I actually in AWS, just for fun. Um, and now I have a reverse shell and I'm able to run the commands interactively and get the results so I can, I don't need to, you know, change it, everything, it takes a lot of time. So I can do my research faster. So that was something interesting. And I can also use the runner, the VM machine for my actions. I can also use to attack other servers inside Azure and outside Azure as well. So it has connection to outside the world because it needs to download stuff. We saw they, they're downloading the crypto miners and um, I can do that as well. So instead of running VPNs or Tor, I can just blame on Microsoft. I can blame on Azure, right? Okay. So yeah, this is the results from the Nmap scans, uh, the ports that are open by default, and, and this was uh, a bit outdated now. I'm not sure if that's still the same. It's still the case, but yeah, port 22, 80, 443, 3389, that's okay, standard. But then the 8084, the mono XSP that we, uh, that we talked about. This is me doing the reverse shell from the, uh, from the runner. Basically, um, it has a netcat on, on the Linux one, but the netcat doesn't have the dash E, and there are other ways to do that, but I have basically downloaded netcat from scratch and compiled and did the backdoor, uh, the connect back, the reverse shell to my uh, instance there. And you can see there that when I have the reverse shell, the Linux one at the bottom there, Azure, sh shows Azure. Uh, yeah, since I can do reverse shells from the runners to my servers, I can also issue malicious commands and uh, scanning other targets, in, even outside of Azure, as I said. Uh, this is the interesting part, and uh, I'm almost done. I said, if someone published a malicious action to the marketplace and another person used it, what would happen? So I did that. I created a separate repo and I created that malicious action in that repo. And in another repo, I called that action. So this is the malicious action that I wrote. Very simple. They call it composite action. And I, get, I grabbed the example from the GitHub itself. So you see, hello world, greet someone. I didn't want to change it, but it's fine. And then the step is run this backdoor.sh. 
right? So I'm making it really clear that this is malicious so people don't use it. And, and even on the name of the repo, I say fake, fake GAGH, right? GitHub action. And yeah, shell bash. Basically, what it's doing is the same thing as the previous one, right? But now from another action, from a third party one. So separately, I'm not call calling that directly. I have the code inside a shell script and I'm calling that action from another, from another repo. So if you look here, here is me calling that fake GHJ, right? This is a separate repo, Ubuntu latest, fake GHJ, third party action, Magna Logan, fake GHJ. Still there, the repos, the, you can take a look. So now I also got to connect back. So what happens if I try to make this action legitimate, if I publish that to the marketplace, and now every time everyone uses my action, they're connected back to my C2 server, to my command and control server. And I would be able to run interactive commands, get their tokens and, you know, have fun, right? Of course, I didn't do that uh, yet, but we'll see. Uh, but yeah, you can see that it works. Okay, so just to wrap up some countermeasures. Um, I know it might not be the best advice, but just be aware of it. Only use actions from trusted creators, the one with the blue check mark. Yes, you can still use the other ones, but if, just be more careful with that. If, if they don't have the, the trusted verified by GitHub, you probably should look at the code, maybe scan the code if it's JavaScript or a language that you have a SaaS scan to do it, that should be better. Um, make sure that you set the right permissions to your actions. So I didn't talk about that, but there is a token that's inside your VM, the GitHub token by default. And up until I think a few weeks ago, that token had read and write permissions to your repo. And that's why the 4K repos uh, attack worked. Now they only have read only, right? The GitHub changed that by default, so that's better. Um, do not run actions from 4K repos, review them first. There is an option to, to, uh, to protect that. And of course, protect your secrets, right? If you're using environment variables, if you're storing sensitive information there, if they have access to your runner, they're gonna have access to that environment, to those environment variables. Um, so yeah, this is the options there to protect your uh, actions permissions, saying that if you're not using any action in your repo, just go ahead and disable. Like, don't allow anyone to run actions there. And this one is the one that uh, from the outside collaborators, right? The forked repos that people were causing the, the problem there with forking multiple repos. This is enabled by default now, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And then it requires approval for the first time contributor, right? So if it's the first time that you're contributing back to that repo, that open source project, for example, then you're gonna require approval to run your actions, right? Um, I think we have about a few minutes for questions, maybe? Okay, yeah, that's it, everyone. Thank you. I'm really think I'm really oh, sorry because I have to to finish this uh, really nice talk and um, some of the audience have some question about the uh, uh, to the speaker please I uh, just we have a minute for for uh, one or two questions no more than this please go ahead no I haven't maybe a, a topic for Next research. And I also want to look at GitLab as well. This is kind of, I want to look at, it's, it's hard to decide, but there is GitLab that's on my radar. Uh, there is self-hosted runners. Someone mentioned that and asked this question uh, when I presented this back in Brazil uh, last year. And there is Azure DevOps, right? Because GitHub Actions is based on Azure DevOps, right? And, and Microsoft has stated that, sorry, I'm, Outside of, uh, Microsoft has stated that they're investing more on GitHub Actions than Azure DevOps, much more, like 10 times more. They're still maintaining Azure DevOps, but first they're trying to keep, uh, get GitHub Actions up to the same level that, that enterprises, large enterprises use, and then they're going to keep focusing on GitHub Actions. So I'm not sure if it's relevant, but GitLab is on my radar and, and self-hosted runners as well. I think there, there is some research, someone published something, uh, maybe a blog or something around self-hosted runners, 
Uh, if you want, I can try to find that find that out for you. Okay. Yeah. Any... Now, we have another one question. Um, thank you very much for to be with us. Uh, please stay here. The next the next talk would be about a one time password. And don't move because uh, if you move, I don't have coffee. And please stay away with me uh, because I need coffee. Okay. See you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.